didn't see me behind the lectern. Um, no, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, just wanted to say hello and welcome to the Paul Mellon Centre uh, for Studies in British Art. We have a week of trained strikes, so really well done to everyone who's actually here in the room. <laughs> and we appreciate your sort of tenacity and um, things like that. Um, we have uh, a lot of people joining in online uh, as well, so hello. But before I actually start uh, introducing the event, I have to run you through some housekeeping, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, there are no fire drills scheduled for the duration of this event, um, so if the fire alarm sounds, please leave your belongings behind and calmly begin to evacuate the building. Uh, your nearest fire exits are on the ground floor through um, either front doors of the centre. Uh, please assemble outside 28 Bedford Square to the right as you leave the building and do not leave the area or attempt to return to the centre until you've been advised it is safe to do so by a uh, member of PMC staff. That's all. Um, so now to properly uh, welcome you to what is the third event in our summer evening research seminar series um, called Liquid Crystal Concrete, the Arts of Post-War Britain, 1945 to 65. Um, so today's event is titled Environmental Surrounds and, we'll be, and we will be hearing talks by Alistair Cartwright and Matthew Wells, um, who are here with us. The session will be chaired by Elaine Howard. Um, Elaine is an architectural historian with History's Historic England and author of Space, Hope and Brutalism. She is co-editor of C20 Society jour uh, journal 20th Century Architecture and um, a related series of biographies. She's currently working on writing on new towns, brutalism, and uh, the architect, Ralph Erskine. So I'll hand over to Elaine at the moment. She'll introduce um, Alistair and Matthew and the session. So over to Elaine. Thank you. I'm going to get beaten out, but the door's going to be the star of the show, isn't it? <laughs> We're not careful. Thanks so much for coming. I'm going to introduce both speakers together and then you can go on if that's all right of you two. So Alistair on my immediate left uh, recently completed his postdoctoral fellowship at, here at the Paul Mellon Centre on private rented housing in post-war London and there's an article on that coming out in 20th century British history on rent tribunals. So it's very interesting to see how that flows into his topic on squatting tonight. And then we're going to hear from Matthew Wells, who's a lecturer at the University of Manchester, did a PhD on 19th century London, book in the autumn, ding, here we go, uh, <laughs> on the architectural model in London during the long 19th century, but currently researching 1960s office buildings as part of a project at following years at e ETH in Zurich, and there's a chapter on the, in the book coming out on that. But first, Alistair, I should let you fly away on the subject of, uh, on, on your topic. Thank you, um, thank you Elaine, and um, thank you so much to the um, PMC for for having me here tonight, and, and really for the um, for the um, really valuable time um, as a, as a postdoctoral fellow here, um, which um, basically resulted in this and some some other things. Um, um, I'm going to set myself a timer. <laughs> um, so. Um, um, oh, this thing is. So I wanted to um, just, just um, I'm going to be talking about this um, movement. Um, oh, sorry, that's better. Okay, I'm going to be talking about this often, often forgotten, often forgotten um, uh, mass squatting movement that took place in 1946. Um, um, it, it basically doesn't appear, as, as far as I'm aware, in, in cultural histories, visual culture, architectural history of the period, although there is some social history on it. Um, and what it involved was um, tens of thousands of, of people across the country taking over 
um, empty army camps, um, uh, many of which were later kind of regularized and services provided by councils. Um, and in London, the movement took a more militant turn in a way where um, several blocks of luxury flats um, were take, taken over. And there was Communist Party leadership in, involved in this particularly, also some labor activists, um, mostly out, outside of these, uh, the, the kind of London scene. Um, and the initially um, sympathetic uh, response in the press and even from the government to the, to the camp squatters turned uh, much more aggressively quite quickly against the so-called luxury squats. Um, um, so I'm, I'm not going to be talking about um, the policies of the Labour Party or the Communist Party or really whether, you know, and to what extent this had um, an impact on uh, uh, changing the course of British housing um, history. And for the record, I think it did. Um, I, what I want to talk about really is its cultural significance in wider terms. Um, the, um, the, the memories and images that it reactivated or reinscribed in a kind of jagged um, uh, historical continuum. Um, so I called this talk, The World Turned Outside In, um, borrowing um, by implication rather than um, quotation from something that the philosopher and critic Richard Volheim wrote. Um, in a 1962 issue of the left liberal and uh, quite unknown to him CIA funded literary magazine Encounter, he wrote of how late 19th century Paris had witnessed a great turning inside out um, of life so that the walls within which the citizen carried on his existence were no longer the inner walls of houses, but the outer walls uh, of those same houses enclosing places and boulevards. Um, Volheim's invoking of Paris and the painterly techniques of Impressionism provides the dialectical counterpoint to a set of observations uh, guided um, by the novels of Colin McInnes about his own early 60s London. And those observations preserve all the startling freshness of a first encounter with the modern. And yet, according to Volheim's own description, um, if not his explicit formulations, they turn on a movement of repetition and rehabilitation, exactly the inverse of the Parisian one, a folding inwards of overextended subjectivities, of deterritorialized energies back inside the domestic, or at least domestically scaled interior. And through that movement, a remaking of the interior itself. And, he, and he, he, he provides this wonderful description here where he says, habitations are altered beyond recognition or put to uses for which they were never intended. A cellar becomes a club. A nonconformist chapel is turned into an all-night cafe. Um, Pubs are given strip lighting and jukeboxes, advertisements for flying cheap to Valletta or Dublin or Kingston, Jamaica, embellished coffee bars, um, and clubs in basements in W11 um, or N4. Sorry, I'm rushing through some of these quotes. Um, it was um, Thomas Crowe's recent book, The Hidden Modern Modern Art, published by the PMC, um, that first drew my attention to this um, wonderful essay by Volheim. Um, but it was an article from 1946 by Tom Harrison, one of the founders of Mass Observation, that sounded the resonance with an earlier, often forgotten post-war moment, the one I'm talking about. Um, recently demobbed from two years in Borneo, Harrison wrote that amid the fine rena renaissance of red tape, in which the struggle to live is almost wholly domestic and the significance of the atom bomb almost entirely repressed, the squatters, he says, were a wonderful relief something outside ourselves, which was dramatically domestic. The squatters Harrison referred to, capitalizing them as if to seal their fame, were those 40,000 plus people, many of them ex-servicemen and women, who in the summer and early autumn of 1946 had taken over around 1,000 empty army camps across the country and in London at least five blocks of high-class luxury flats in one hotel. The latter became known as the luxury squats in a slightly sneering recognition from the press and will be my main subject. And he, this is Harrison again, he writes. Um, he laments, really. After Australia, Manila, a Sarawak longhouse, or the easy friendship of soldiers, it is horrid to stand solitary in a city pub or face your fellows in the train speechless, almost ashamed. One longs to reach out and talk a little to an out to the elderly gentleman with the checked waistcoat reading Kafka to strike up an, an unambitious interstation intimacy with a nice, dumb-looking blonde. How else can we ever plumb dumbness? Each day that passes, one orientally acquired easiness and directness of manner shrink back a little farther 
in the unsatisfied apparatus of a civilized ego. It is so much more comfortable to live all around one, to push out and pull back the pseudopedia of contact and conflict, of interchanged argument and fun wherever one goes, instead of living in the restricted circle of private Western experience. Um, the wartime baptism of oriental uncivilization couches the casual dehumanization of the dumb-looking blonde in a narrative of masculine adventure that Harrison strains to reject elsewhere. Um, but the juxtaposition with the 1946 squatting moment is not by chance. The fact is, many of those taking part had just returned from service overseas. And it's unsurprising to see Harrison's remarks find a resonance in a cartoon appearing in the trenchantly anti-Stalinist ILP newspaper Socialist Leader. <coughs> Wartime memories of overseas burnish the image of the camp squatters with the warm glow of pride and service and collective sacrifice. But this is juxtaposed in a thoroughly gendered way with the image of the luxury squatters as cranks, people unable to accept the parameters of making do and getting by. Both cartoons are by someone called SB, and I haven't been able to identify who that is. Um, um, the first presents the squats as a perfectly ordinary, if not perfect, domestic scene. In the second, two neighbours exchange views about the odd one out in their street, possibly a spinster, late of Duchess of Bedford's mansions. Um, so there are, there are issues here that I want to return to, to later in, in Harrison's very kind of complicated and problematic um, linking of the squats to his, um, to his service experience. Um, for now, I want simply to note the recurrence of the spatial figure of inversion described by Harrison and Bollheim, of the crossing of thresholds of an unknown and, and yet strangely familiar outside, an outside marked by its easiness and the wonderful relief it provides, which somehow reinfiltrates the inside, occupying the homely space in that same movement um, it is alienated uh, in the same movement that it is alienated from it. Um, so this photographic double spread is is from the uh, the Illustrated uh, London News, um, and it shows the the first building to be occupied, um, Duchess of Bedford House in Kensington. Um, uh, and the images, I think, what's interesting about the, the images is they direct our attention to the the thronging of people around the building's thresholds. Um, surfaces and spaces. The dark piercings of unlit windows interrupting the bright horizontal bands of ashlar rendered facades and the bright faces within. A stuttering seven-story facade <coughs> that seems even more fortress-like thanks to the bricked-up intermediate levels. People climbing through the lower windows, a baby being passed through another window, a sympathizer throwing up a package people milling around the railings surrounding another nearby smaller building. These are, in a way, undistinguished images. Their grid format presentation is designed to hurry along the reader's comprehension, giving an impression of directionless commotion that confirms the heading, lawless measures which endanger the rights of law-abiding citizens. But the very obliqueness or cursoriness of the images, the way our eyes bounce off their surfaces, also testifies to an interaction between reporter and squatter that shouldn't be taken for granted. The technique was common currency. If the Illustrated London News offered a smorgasbord of newsworthiness, Picture Post deployed a modernistically stripped-down version of the same underlying principles to create this um, didactic split screen, the squatters and the squatted against. Both are deserving, but one hurts the chances of the other, seems to be the message. The people who are once the discreet and obliging objects of social investigation, from Booth to the compendious and inquiry into people's homes produced by mass observation in 1943, are now the people deciding, quite vocally, who to include and who to exclude from their adopted homes. The eyes of the poor, to recall Baudelaire's poem, gaze across at the viewer, but only now from within the hallowed spaces of the rich. So there's a way in which I think, yeah, this, this remaining on the outside um, testifies to a certain relationship, a certain inversion. I, I mean, the, this, the way these, these, these photographs, photographs don't penetrate the building and the, the interior. 
The photographs in the Illustrated London News and other papers testify to this crossing of thresholds and turning of tables. While the written text of newspaper reports essentially regurgitates the standard attack lines, queue jumping, upsetting the fair administration of needs, and so on, we can look to another source for insights that begin, begin to widen the crack opened up by these images. Um, the, the mass observation collections at Sussex include a stack of um, handwritten reports by three mass observers, um, which, which I found um, incredibly interesting. Uh, and one of these, by an observer who identifies himself um, as JPS, describes his experience um, at the Fillimore Garden squat in Kensington. Um, he inquires of an ATS officer at their billet whether she knows of any squatters who have moved in, and the, the ATS officer um, um, suggests two nearby houses. Um, the first, a four-story house, empty in appearance, whose, quote, steps lead up to a shabby front door, a dirty white card with an E boldly printed on it is nailed to the lintel. And I think we recognize here the familiar tropes of social investigators venturing into the slums, the mood of trepidation and secrecy, as well as telltale signs of dilapidation in an otherwise salubrious area. Um, JPS rings the doorbell. There is no answer, so he rings again. Uh, quote, FC30, meaning a skilled worker around 30 years old, um, uh, a woman, appears at the closed ground floor window, tries to speak through window. MC25 appears. He attempts to open window. Here steps approaching front door, which opens a few inches on a chain. The interviewer states his business. The squatter at the door, MC25, replies, that's what you all say. Look, look what they print. The interviewer explains that he is not a reporter and, is, in his own words, urges him <coughs> that if people are to know the truth, uh, they must have the personal stories of the squatters. This exchange at the, um, at the chained door displays all the tension and class-ridden anxiety that is usually suppressed in reports on London's working-class housing. Eventually, JPS is admitted into the building, and the man at the door does supply him with his personal story, only to declare... I know it's not much good telling you this. It's been said before. Numerous other incidents in mass observation reports mirror this um, doorstep inquiry, and um, this is, this is a, uh, uh, another one. Um, I'm going to rush through some of this, but um, um, these, um, these descriptions indicate the suspicion surrounding reporters and the sheer disregard paid to often absent authorities. And there's a wonderful incident at um, the Fountain Court squat in Victoria where two children are playing on the, the entrance steps and a police officer says, what are you doing here? And they say, we live here. And he says, no, you don't. <laughs> Get off. And they just carry on and they ignore him. Um, um, uh, but, but, but as well as, as, well as indicating this, this, this kind of suspicion, they also they present the threshold of the building as a staging post for a fragmentary discourse on the plight of the homeless, the authority of government, the responsibility for children, the role of women, and other issues. Um, and you can see in this, in this, um, in this uh, quote here how, um, how that kind of staging of dialogue um, around these, um, these threshold spaces that the reporter can't enter into mostly um, works, um, the kind of arguments that happen. Um, uh, this pattern of overheard conversation continues um, over the course of a morning. Um, and you, you have these wonderful kind of incidents of people passing by. There's a kind of blackboard with a, pet a petition set up outside and, 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 and different remarks from people. Um, MB50, a um, uh, middle class man of around 50, according to the reporter, says, It's anarchy. We never did anything like this after the last war. Um, a group of MDs, I expect they're all sitting down to their steak and onions. Um, a soldier, MC30, um, working class soldier of about 30. I felt like doing that myself three years ago. Um, this quietly bubbling cacophony of voices fails to entirely displace the position of the reporter, observer. Instead, it seems to nag away at the fundamental question raised by Harrison's reaction. What is that something outside ourselves? And who, in any case, is us? Who are the squatters and what zone of society or popular consciousness 
as well as physical space do they occupy? <clears throat> With this in mind, we, we can return to some of the photos from the illustrated London News. Don't they, like mass observation, snippets of conversation um, and repetitious, stuttering class codifications ask the same question? Something is happening, but you don't know what it is, they seem to say. Smiling faces and babies on knees and pipes hanging out of mouths in one window frame. And glowering faces in the next. As if the two windows offered, like picture posts split screen but some, somehow more menacing, two images of the people, respectable and un unrespectable, C-class and D-class, amiable and abominable, the happy poor and the frightening poor. Where might we look to escape these split-screen stereotypes? The sociologist and novelist Diana Murray Hill, herself um, previously a mass observer, um, asked the same fundamental question, who are the squatters, in an article of that title published in Pilot Papers, um, the journal founded in 1945 by Harrison's former collaborator, Charles Madge. And without fully uh, abandoning uh, mass observation style of conversational montage, <coughs> Murray's Hill, Murray Hill's article offers a series of sketches drawn from inside the squats, following her subjects over several days. And these are sketches rather than snapshots, in that no automatic coherence is given to them. What coherence they have is patched together, beginning with the first chancy gestures thrown down onto the blank page. Um, and this is what Murray Hill has to say about the squatters of Duchess of Bedford House. Um, um, I won't read it all, but she, she kind of describes in a much more um, kind of fully narrativized way than the mass observation reports um, the uh, uh, a kind of movement through space um, and uh, with these little kind of portraits of, uh, of, of individuals. Um, who were, who were shown to be really kind of taking charge of the situation and, um, and, and running it in an organized way and transforming it. Um, uh, Murray Hill, who wrote a fictionalized account of her days working in a munitions factory, creates a series of thumbnail portraits that are really renderings or of ensembles of characters moving in space. I would go further. Following Lefebvre, these novelistic uh, sketches show space being forged through the passage of the social and the bodily. The lift lobby is transformed into a ch children's play area. A barrier is erected to keep reporters out. The cinder yard, dug with trenches, becomes a kitchen. Large single flats are doubled up, and a shed hosts a performance by the Unity Theatre. Searching for a visual analogue, I cannot help thinking of this, another double-page spread in the Illustrated London News. Uh, the artist is Bri Brian de Grino, um, known for his earlier work for the motoring press and employed by the Illustrated London News as a World War II correspondent in France. Uh, and he uses the same comic strip technique perfected in his wartime correspondence, and this is just one example of hundreds. Um, de Grino presents an unfolding picture book story of the squats that, in its seeming innocuousness, feels strikingly at odds with the headline, the dupes of communist promises and the cat's paw of the party's tactics. Um, as in Murray Hill's writing, there is the same lively sense of material incident, a baby cat carried in a drawer. You can see that just about. Um, a baby carried in a drawer, electrical wires trailing from the ceiling, a cat in the newly christened nursery. The same sense, too, of hub hub and human activity, the same swift fullness of character, not the same as depth, and a similar hint of sentimentality. These last two aspects appear related. It is the refusal to be disturbed by the unknowable depths of subjectivity, the willingness to accept a certain dumbness, as Harrison put it, that both secures the image its humanity and seems to give the lie to that assurance. Working quickly in charcoal. Oh, should I close that? I've got a message, a pop-up. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, de Grino often reverts to types. The woman sitting on the low wall in the foreground resembles the working class matriarch at the center of that image of community developed later by Wilmot and Young, Richard Hoggart and others. In Hoggart's words, she appears in the natural environment of home and family, splendidly there, and despite all the troubles within her, is ultimately content. 
what um, Hoggett's image excludes, of course, um, and, and I would say de Grinnell's, is all those working class women who were not attached to male heads of household, as well as those who were not or who refused to be content. Um, in some of the panels, we even seem to get flashbacks to the bustling street life of 19th century London. Um, this is um, Gustave Doré's engraving, the organ in the court from, um, from his um, London a pilgrimage. Um, and there's a similar sense of teeming humanity cut through with a sentimentality that, that attempts to individualize each figure. Um, and yet de Grinnell's uh, drawings possess very little of the morbid fascination of the slums that not only attracted Doré, but had a hold 70 years later on reporters and artists who ventured into London's public shelters during the Blitz. And this is one of Bill Brand's famous photos um, of Liverpool Street. Um, of course, um, Brand um, emerged as a photographer in a world that was still largely defined by 19th century traditions. Um, and one of Brand's photo stories on the eve of the war was actually a direct homage to, to Doré. Um, but there's a paradox here, because it is Brand's Victorian investigator's attraction to the dire and the ghoulish, the sense of his figures inhabiting a world between life and death, that redeems these images from being mere illustrations of an already mythologized notion of collective resilience, the idea that London, unified beyond class divisions, could take it. And yet it's de Grinnell's unabashedly illustrative, illustrative drawings that recall the real history of the tube shelters and other acts of collective initiative. In response to the inequalities of different types of shelter, ranging from the basement of the Hungaria restaurant um, in Lower Regent Street, where people could book a breakfast table in the morning after, after their shelter at night, to the infamous Tilbury shelter in Stepney, uh, the communist councillor Phil Pyrrhton led 70 Stepney residents into the Savoy in an invasion of the hotel's basement. In the same month, a communist activist broke open the gates of a tube station with a crowbar uh, and got on a megaphone to call people in. More spontaneously and despite official protest about the risks of shelter mentality, people in East London bought half-penny tickets and simply refused to leave till morning. We could then read these drawings as images of the communist family, the kind of all-embracing world of clubs and literature and daily rituals and manners of speech that Raphael Samuel records in his posthumously published book, The Lost World of British Communism. That should be a question, could we? <laughs> um, but if that reading has any truth to it, it is surely because an even larger mood wraps itself around this already complete and apparently self-enclosed world, as Samuel writes. Um, and I'm coming to the end now. Our anxiety about deviation, this is Samuel, in, in others and repression of it in ourselves had evident homologies with and may have drawn invisible support from the behavioral norms of the time. We were not the only people to hide our doubts, even in ourselves, to repress feelings of incipient guilt, to keep a close watch on the tongue. In all sectors of British life, a conformity to rules went far beyond mere mechanical obedience. It structured public speech where solecism betrayed a humble origin and where the word spoken out of place invited ostracism. It had its obvious sartorial analogues in a society where for a woman to ladder her stockings was a social disaster and where men hitched their trouser creases for fear of baggy knees. The same affective collectivity um, which reached its zenith in the 1950s, according to Sam, uh, 40s rather, according to Samuel, structured the Labour Party as well as the Communist Party, and even to some extent the Conservative Party. It reached deep into the institutions of working life and leisure. This same affect, it seems to me, enshrouds de Grinnell's drawings, but it is a myth, as, as much as the myth of the Blitz, and the brittleness of de Grinnell's typification gives that away much more than Samuel's vivid prose. Something like a true image of the squats is absent. We find only a shadow of it in the dissonance generated at the edges of images such as this one, between the boy with slouched shoulders and his hands in his pockets and the woman in sunglasses. The rest of the figures are official, then entering, entering the building. Um, in the two boys peering so casually over a wall as prams and furniture are handed over railings, or in the smile of a woman carrying a bed frame up the stairs, something is happening, but you don't know what it is. Thank you. Thank
now we'll go on to Matthew Wells and bring us slightly go, come from the 40s to the 60s and 70s and a more specific form of organisation. I don't trust my pointing. <laughs> I brought a pointer. <laughs> These are your glasses. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go on. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much, um, Sharia and Shauna, for inviting and organizing all of this. Super. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, ah, so we don't need that slide. Um, in 1964, Francis Duffy published an essay in the Architectural Review on office design. He declared, I quote, architecture is an image of society, office layout of organizational form. Duffy was a young British architect. He trained on the other side of the square at the Architectural Association uh, before going on to Princeton to write a PhD about systems uh, theory and its relationship to architecture, its potential application to architecture. And what he was describing were, uh, was kind of shorthand for the changes occurring in post-war British society, where the service industries were expanding and becoming to stand for the economy as a whole. By uh, 1965, some three, million, uh, some three million people in the UK were employed in office settings, including almost 1.8 million women who were employed as uh, typists and secretaries, amongst other roles. And this total number, this 3 million, was an increase of 50% on the census of 1951, some 14 years earlier. And as a result, well over 100 million square metres of office space was constructed in the post-war period from 1945 to 1965. Oh, no. <laughs> um, returning to Duffy's essay for a moment. He didn't really discuss Britain this essay. Rather, his essay from 1964 that I quoted from earlier focused on a new type of office that was being pioneered in West Germany. A pair of management consultants, uh, Erpart and Wolfgang Schneller, founded Quickborner team in uh, 1960, 1956. Quickborner would go on to develop uh, a new approach to corporate architecture known as Bureau Landschaft. Initially known as organizations uh, cybernetic. The principles of Bureau Landschaft were based around the flow of information in a corporation. These flows were designed to optimize the administration and communication of office work. And this new approach was comprehensive. It took into account the operations of individual workers, teams and departments in relationship in relation to companies as a whole. And crucially, it also considered non-human agents, such as office equipment, uh, house plants, and partitions as a part of this uh, organism. As a part of a design process, management, workers, and Quickborner would all collaborate together to identify organizational units, known as departments, and identify their role uh, within a company as a whole. These units would be linked together in a networked web with their communications identified first through abstract diagrams. And these networks would become spatialized through plan drawings and later large-scale models. The ultimate concept, or the aim, was an open plan arrangement with a looser distribution of uh, departments across a large floor plate. Each department would be defined by clusters of flexible partitions and furniture, office equipment, and plants. Each of these clusters were connected. Um, con each of these clusters were connected to questions regarding acoustics, noise, and its sources had to be identified and resolved in the design stage of office space. We see this here in uh, a plan of an office building in West Germany from the end of the 1960s, designed with the Bureau Landschaft approach. Uh, I just need to explain the rotation of this drawing. That this is a a kind of uh, a diagram 
that should be overlaid on the top of here, but they've rotated by 90 degrees. So this toilet block is this toilet block, and this is these offices here. So just rotate it in your minds. Um, this zoning diagram shows us how the different um, how these different organizational departments and the main conduits of communications between them worked. These are indicated with arrows between these outlines of a, of a department and then this arrow that connects between them, showing these different interrelationships in a corporation. The furniture in the diagram is absent, but we see the structural grid of the building, the columns that hold the building up. And we also see meeting points, which are marked in these dark... Um, these black circles, these are potential meeting points where different departments could come together, discuss the work that they're engaging in. But also, um, loud uh, printers, photocopiers, uh, card, mach uh, yeah, card machines, sorting machines, card indexing machines, were all pushed to the perimeter of the, uh, of the, of the office of, of the plan. Um, they would have less effect or, and or they would be enveloped in a, in a ring of house plants to dampen the noise. Why was this approach taken? Well, Quickborner's studies noted how visible noise had double the physiological effect and the psychological effect of invisible noise sources on the workforce. All sources of noise in the office, like telephones and doorbells, as we're hearing, and fax machines needed to be made invisible. This matters because Bureau Landschaft was intended to be a physiologically optimal environment for work. Nothing could reduce the effectiveness of the corporate machine. Any sort of disturbance was understood to be damaging for well-being and ultimately for productivity. Zoning the space could only achieve so much in the eyes of Quickborner. Carpet was the answer. Architects and critics described how the carpet not only deadened sound by stopping it, reverberating, but it also changed people's behavior in a space. Workers would move about more slowly, their brogues, their high heels, deadened by the soft, luxurious pile of the carpet underneath them. Workers would speak more quietly, aware of their actions on the ambient sound levels in a room, and Quickborner would analyze these studies through um, in plan and also kind of reverberation times in section using sound engineers. Quickborner also had their own brochure on carpets to be used in offices. This brochure contained uh, invaluable advice on how to source and to use carpets within the modern office environment. The tagline of the brochure was, uh, Bleiben Sie auf den Teppich, stick with carpet. And it, it, it described a variety of different types of carpet, each with different production techniques and material characteristics. And the back of the brochure contained a selection of carpet samples, as we see here on the right-hand uh, part of the slide. Normally, I don't make aesthetic judgments in my research, but really, these are extraordinarily bad carpets. <laughs> and, but the aim of the publication was not uh, to directly sell carpets, uh, but to convince architects and designers and companies of their use. Ultimately, the brochure argued that carpets were not only for domestic interiors, but could provide comfort in the corporate environment as well. This physical well-being, it claimed, was a prerequisite for maintaining and increasing performance in the office too. In a British context, Bureau Landschaft became combined with approaches from East Coast America, so Francis Duffy, studying from Princeton, at Princeton, coming back to the United Kingdom, translated the different aspects of bureau, the different aspects of collaboration from Bureau Landschaft for an English-speaking audience, offering a new method for designers, and started his own consultancy. And it was Duffy too who identified the acoustic issues, noting how carpet changed people's behaviour in a space. Architectural journals began to carry supplements on carpet specifications, and the ROBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, based on the other side of uh, Tottenham Court Road, had their own carpet design library as a part of their materials library, where architects could go and choose uh, and touch the, the, the carpets they were specifying. While Norman Foster, uh, an architect who 
after studying at Manchester, went and studied with um, Serge Chemeyev at Yale. And again, a different application of a more systems-based theory. He described uh, in various lectures at the time how Foster Associates were operating with methods from cybernetics and systems theory, as well as organizational studies very closely related to Bureau Landschaft. And these diagrams that he showed in a lecture at the RABA at the end of the 1960s emphasized ideas such as group participation, teamwork, and, and, and quality as a means to increase productivity, both within the buildings he was designing and overseeing the construction, but also within the practice of the architect pits themselves. And at the Greenbridge Industrial Estate in Swindon, we see, a major, uh, we see a major example of this type of development in the Reliance Controls building. This was a manufacturer of precision electronic instruments, very small scale uh, precision uh, electronic instruments. It's a building designed by Team 4, a practice uh, formed from Sue Rogers, Wendy Cheeseman, Richard Rogers, and Norman Foster. And the building was planned around the linear relationships of mass production. Management and production processes were, were located in essentially the same space. The only hierarchy was that of the production and development line for the objects produced. Machine rooms, design offices, uh, and assembly lines could all be seen in a single view from a single point in the building. Smell and noise were problems that the architects did not address. However, communication between the different departments within an organization, rather than locating them in different buildings, were all improved. And in part, this was because of the building's mechanical and environmental servicing. What we have is a concrete slab on the floor with a central trench running down the middle of it for services. Perpendicular to this are so running perpendicular either side to this are electrical services and telephone connections. And these connections would sprout off at gridded intervals, so one, two, three, four, etc. This allows any area of the building to be used for any part of the company's industrial activity and allows for the possibility of expansion, change, contraction, etc. These ideas were also explored on a conceptual level. Uh, at the end of the 1960s, Foster uh, edited the third edition of Man Plan, an experimental issue of the Architectural Review. His editorial direction focused on the modern workplace and how it could be produced, organized, and integrated better within wider infrastructural developments in the United Kingdom. One intention was to create new spheres that allowed for the reorganization of work within society. And in their study of communications infrastructure, Man Plan predicted that the future working spaces of Britain would be controlled environments. Ceilings and floors, the magazine claimed, would be set to a common module, thereby, I quote, concealing a, a network of wires and pipes and quietly, quietly unifying the complex computer world. This is because these new environments were part of the uptake of computers in the UK. Computers began to order electoral roles. They began to control the production of goods in factories. They would record land transfers for local governments, national governments. Everything from ballet tickets to, um, the, elect to the energy network were com was computerized. And new data centers, new control centers were designed and constructed to enable this systemic change in Britain. With this in mind, in March 1970, Foster Associates were asked to design uh, a new head offices for IBM UK at Cosham near Portsmouth. The company wanted to relocate from their headquarters in Chiswick and be closer to the nearby production facility at Havant. Havant is just here and Cosham is just here and this is obviously the, the Solent. The building would also be located on a site adjacent to the new uh, M27 motorway, opened slightly later in the 1970s. And IBM's brief to the architects was that their office should be high spec in order to both show the company's ethos, this is forward thinking technological organization, but also attract workers relocating from London. A firm of Dutch engineers, 
began the process of reclaiming land from the sea for the new site while existing IBM employees and their families were bussed in or out from London, from Chiswick to uh, the south coast to enjoy day trips to their new home and to see what their new life would be like when they relocated. Um, at Cosham, Foster designed, Foster Associates designed uh, a single level deep plan building with full environmental controls. It's one of the uh, first buildings that uses a lightweight steel frame known as METSEC, which was laid out in a sequence of seven, by seven meters by seven meter structural bays and then wrapped in this fabulous brown bronze glass curtain wall. The steel frame system uh, gave the building several uh, benefits. It could be very quickly constructed above a concrete raft foundation, a very quick foundation. And it was a flexible space. Initially, the, the building, the pilot office, his head, head office, could house uh, 750 workers, but could be expanded and extended indefinitely in uh, any direction, double, triple, but like an, an amoeba-like expansion. And the large uh, open plan office adopts certain aspects of the Bureau uh, Landschaft approach. The core is pushed to the perimeter of the building um, to leave the majority of the floor plan open or potentially open. Uh, within this core is a, a pause realm, a kind of 24-hour um, open kind of breakout space as opposed to a kind of sequenced cafeteria like was very typical in British offices at that time. There's blocks of toilets and there is a computer room, which we will return to later. Um, and this core is the only fixed element in the building, other than the, the structural columns. Within the open plan offices, a thick carpet is used to regulate the, uh, regulate the acoustic environment for staff. It's a brownish pink carpet. It was specially designed by the architects, and its appearance was tested uh, under mercury vapor recessed light fittings, which we can see above in here. It was glued directly onto the concrete slab to dampen the sound. And a post-occupancy survey by uh, IBM discovered that only 1% of the workforce complained or, or found the general noise level to be high in the offices. And respondents identified the carpet in overcoming the noise problems associated with the open plan uh, organization. However, the organization of the building resisted uh, taking a total Bureau Landschaft approach because of the provision of energy, air, and power in the building. Uh, on the roof of the building were air conditioning units. The main service pipe work was located underneath these, within the uh, envelope of the building, but above uh, a suspended ceiling and the kind of occupied realm of the offices. Um, each column, as I was talking about, these steel columns had uh, a structural role and a communications role. Each column was, of course, a load-bearing column uh, made of a folded steel plate. This folded steel plate meant that it was hollow and pipes and wires could run down from the surface zone down to the, to the world of the offices below and, and then spread out to the desks around them. As we saw earlier in the Bureau Landschaft approach, the open plan office was about flexibility and interdepartmental organization. At Cosham, however, IBM wanted, architecture to, wanted the architecture itself to operate as a coherent system, like the data processing machines that it sold. And this manifested itself in a kind of pure and ordered geometry, a pure and ordered interiority that IBM sought to offer through its products. At an award ceremony in 1972, the IBM UK uh, managing director described how the open plan interior was an experiment in the rearrangement of IBM's working structure. Previous departments uh, in, the, in the headquarters in Chiswick had operated autonomously with secretaries responsible for many tasks. 
But the organization of the new building replaced this with a new system based around modules, or what they termed modules. IBM believed that this new approach would bring increased efficiency through the subdivision of secretarial work into groups. Each group would be formed from a series of individuals within a new system um, of these modules. And each individual would have a series of very specific tasks. So in the foreground here is Margaret Selvridge, a secretarial assistant who answered the telephone and covered reception. On the right is Lorna Rust, a secretarial personal assistant who organized the departmental uh, research and finances. And on the left is Ursula Arnold, a unit manager responsible for the uh, organization of the unit, the module as a whole. As IBM described it, I quote, it is a chance for the girls to be mistress of one trade rather than of necessity be Jill of all. However, all the girls at Cosham are trained to have general knowledge of each other's operations, end quote. Each group would be based in a particular area in the office, formed from an indefinite number of workstations, able to expand and contract where required. There's a whole series of studies that Foster undertake where they design the furniture, they design these different types of modular uh, organization uh, through desks, partitions, chairs, etc., that can come together in different settings and also be taken apart again. Individual workers, their tasks and their desk were all modular completely ordered within this logic of IBM's corporate environment. There was also another aspect to the modularity of the IBM office. And as the computer and the telephone began to dominate the office space, these cables and conduits were not only in the way of users, they also limited change and movement to seatings, desks, and organizational groups. But the solution uh, to making communications infrastructure more flexible was already in the building. Within one large room in the core, as I pointed out earlier, were the massive computer terminals that IBM were developing and selling. This area was 600 millimeters higher than the floor level in the main offices. Thanks to a raised access floor, uh, which concealed the conduits beneath. These conduits provided the data, the power, um, and the cooling for the computer systems. And because of the gridded nature of the floor, as we see here, cabling was flexible, and the computer terminals could be uh, positioned anywhere, as well as moved around and, ch and, and changed when obsolete. In turn, the carpet of the office, essential for its acoustic role, adapted to this new modular reality. We might argue that the corporate environment was an ever-expanding range of modules, from the computer chip to the storage devices, the computer room, to the building that houses the room, to the production and logistics networks of the corporation. Modular systems in architecture uh, coincided with the development of early computing systems and automation technologies. Architects and engineers proposed systems of standardized modules at every scale of the building. This modular architecture was open-ended, with its most important relationship being the next module that was connected to it within a larger system or a sequence. In the 1960s, we see that these developments affect the carpet. It changes from a surface material, a fabric cut to measure and fitted to a geometric space, to an individual unit. We know this is a carpet tile often 450 millimeters square in size. This was a unit synchronized with the overall organization of a building and a company. That is to say, the organization of the building's structure, its furniture planning, its environmental services. In 1965, the glue down installation method was first developed in America and then adopted in British carpet factories, especially in the West Midlands. Rare shout out for Kidderminster at the Full Mellon Center. Uh, the tile allowed for quicker installation. It improved maintenance as individual tiles could be replaced independent of one another in the system. In 
and the carpet, now a tiled module, adapted to the changing nature of construction. This is not construction as a singular element, but a series of layers that provide, provide and perform very different functions within a building. As the computer reduced in size and became more prevalent in work, the design spaces, or the, sorry, the design briefs for office spaces uh, began to demand more power and better data and communications. We can see a development of this approach uh, in an office for the insurance brokers, Willis Faber Dumas in Ipswich. Based around open plan office floors, departments could be expanded or contracted at will with communication between the different working groups simplified. The extra cables required for telephones, electricity, and data processing moved into the floor void. New products were developed to house and ultimately conceal these services. The carpet tile, as well as offering an acoustic damper, became fitted to panels so it could be lifted and removed at will to access the services beneath something that was very difficult and required a ladder or scaffolding when these services were in the uh, ceiling void. And crucially, this combination of carpet tile and access floor allows for, both, allows for both the acoustic performance as well as the flexibility. As the workstations of individuals, groups, uh, and companies could be rearranged around the floor plate of the office as things changed. As desks and people could be reconfigured, the carpet itself could easily be replaced and repaired. New technologies, Ethernet cables, and eventually Wi-Fi boxes would replace obsolete cables within. So, to conclude, I would argue that the working environment of modern Britain, space became something universal, and flexibility was its main concern. Not just within buildings, but also territorially as companies began to leave or left inner city London. It was defined only by an applied grid of performance, structural, environmental, managerial, becoming both the appearance and instrument of changing social economic conditions. At the time, in the late 1960s, the Architectural Review claimed that the buildings designed by Foster Associates had reduced architectural expression to its absolute minimum. These buildings were I quote, nothing more than a prop for an enclosing membrane. They are not an architectural setting, but an environment. And we have seen how the carpet made this environment possible, first to solve an acoustic issue, then adapting to the changing technological nature of work in post-war Britain. Thank you very much. Which one is yours? I have no idea. I think blue. Blue and then orange is for the audience. So we need Alistair back. <laughs> Should I sit in the middle? Be very symmetrical. <laughs> um, and it shows, doesn't it, how society moved between the end of the 40s and the, the mid-60s. I mean, they were really different. But the one... Um, and it was interesting, good thing that you, you were ending with uh, Willis Faber when I was writing the Space, Hope and Brutalism book and went there. They still operate in that way. Uh, and so, except that, they don't need the cables anymore. You know, and you think, how did you get Bureau Landshaft when you got a straight row of plugs? That was really... But it brought out that the one thing I was scribbling that sort of came together was that it was both about how these spaces were used inside and how people connected. There you had that incredibly nuclear family in their hut, Burma, hut from Burma. And then the mass of people in the flats and I wondered how it what how you, if you knew how much they were socially organized inside um, within the within the flats mm. yeah I mean there was an incredible level of organization um, there were committees established and everything from crashes to the supply of milk which um, you know people had to re-register for their for their milk ration uh, was organized theater performances were put on um, 
Um, and I, I think a very interesting thing about the adaptation of the space is um, I, I didn't really go into the architectural side of it, but I have looked at the plans of Duchess of Bedford House, and these were um, upper middle class service flats um, um, with a traditional, very uh, trad kind of skin, um, but um, taking, you know, incorporating all of the, at the time, later services built in um, 1937, I believe. Um, and, but, but, the, but at the same time, the, those very large flats included um, servants' quarters. Um, so so they, they have this relic of a, of a, of a much older traditional um, um, uh, you know, form of upper-class life. Um, and, but, but each flat was taken over by two families so, you, you know, during the squat. So there's, there must have been an interesting kind of um, reoccupation of that space. But, but yeah, in, in short, they were, they were, there was a, an incredible degree of organisation inside, I think. I, I, want, I, want, I wanted to, do I need this? Sure. I think we can bring you on the okay. Okay. Super, thank you. Oh, that's good. But, uh, and, and, and what happened when it finished? Did it carry on? Did these organisations carry on? Did communities mm -hmm. develop with uh, relationships formed yeah, in different ways? Yeah, that's a really good question that I can't, that I can't answer. So, I mean, the, the, the squatting of the camps, and um, um, Don Watson has kind of written the, the book on this whole history, and, and anyone who wants to know about it should read that, 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 that book. Um, Shows how they were, and they a lot of them were, yeah, became semi permanent councils, provided services to them, and so on. But the the flats, you know, they were they were evicted after um, um, I can't remember something like ten days. Um, um, so um, and, you know, and the, and the government became very very worried about this situation, as you, as you can imagine, because it was an infringement of pri on private property. Um, but yeah, I don't know if any organisation kind of lingered on. Mo most people were rehoused quite quickly as a result of the pressure that was brought to bear, and there were various other consequences. And was this connected to real estate? Was this, you know, sorry. No, no, sorry. it's me. No, 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 go for it. <laughs> because, you know, was, um, was there, I mean, now it would be if the council tax doesn't get paid, you would get thrown out. But I wondered if there was, you know, um, how this worked in terms of ground rents, you know, the leasehold freehold system, like how, how? So an important thing I didn't say, I should have said at the beginning, is that these, in these buildings, um, most of the buildings they squatted were requisitioned flats that were standing mm. empty. Mm -hmm. And Duchess of Bedford House was due to be handed back to its owners the Prudential um, uh, Assurance um, you know, Society, whatever the company was called, um, and would then lease it out. Um, yeah, but it was, in, it was in this kind of liminal state which are then extended, and so that's the opportunity. Do we have questions from the floor? I'm just trying to throw this open. Yes. Do you've got a microphone? I'm just worried about the online people yes. who are going to chip in with questions too. So they've got a question for you. Um, I'm wondering if um, you found any links between these squats and the commons, um, such as common lands and the enclosure movement. Um, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, in I mean, in the broadest possible sense, they are they are an experiment in commoning. I think. Um, in creating an occupying communal space, um, whether there's an actual, you know, when there was any kind of in, like invoking of, you know, the the memory of the diggers or stuff like that, and uh, or anti enclosure movements, I don't, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about a very different, very different period here. Um, yeah. Um. Thanks. Another question for you, Alistair, about um, that, fi that final uh, double page spread that you talked about. Is it De Grigny? I'm not sure how you Yeah, De Grigny, yeah. I was very struck by that, fi that an image that you showed in detail with the, the family gathered around the table. Mm. With the, and I, I saw that in the, in the two page spread, that was very much the kind of the final image in the mm. bottom right hand mm. corner. It was a kind of mm. conclusion mm. of the day's activities mm. and of the whole moment. Mm. And, 
although, as you said, the, the title of the article seemed very condemnatory mm. and critical, that final image to which he puts his name is a very reassuring and sim seemingly exactly. sympathetic one. Yeah. And one in which the squatters are reduced. This is a very interesting tr transition that happens between this kind of mass movement or the collective, and then you finally mm. end up with this image of the Definitely. family. You know, that kind of ideal, yeah, I don't know, yeah. the ideal working or middle class family gathered around a table. Mm. The other side of which you sit as either the viewer or the artist, mm. and you sort of you're a part of mm. what seems to be a very reassuring domestic scene yeah, rather than yeah. one that suggests danger. Yeah, I think that's I think that's um, spot on, and it's really interesting to notice that it is the final panel in the in the sequence of images. I, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that's what I was kind of trying to get at with this this final quote from Raf Raphael Samuel um, where he discusses the, the communist fam family. He talks a lot about, <coughs> you know, communist party families, labor party families, and um, the, the kind of um, the richness of life involved in that, but also it's um, kind of potentially blinkered aspects. And, um, um, you know, and, and but it's it, it, for him, it's part of a, of, a, of, a, of a larger kind of you know collective moment or something. The the era of mass society of big corporations and institutions and uh, um, dancing in step and going to holiday camps and, and what have you. So there's there's somehow a way in which um, he's suggesting that 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 um, um, communist family is in which those traditions are passed on and, and so on. I, it, it exists within this, somehow within this larger um, collectivity. I don't know how better to put it than that, but I think, I think that's a really interesting observation, what you said about the, the image specifically. And it's really interesting, isn't it, how that image is, is exactly the, the sort of forming of the new, the way that the family is going from I mean, it's Rattray Taylor and then it's Wilmot and Young coming down through the 50s, but the family is getting ever more nuclear. And I wondered how your experience of this, but the, sort of the, the big the, the parties was the sort of last gasp against that and the big organisation, just as your work is getting down from the big corporation down to the little team in very much the same kind of way. So I wondered if I have a but you Maybe could I can comment pass it in on turn. To, to Matthew at this point. Yeah, yeah exactly. There is, there's, a, there's a social shift here, which maybe maybe you, you want to comment on, or perceived social yeah. <laughs> social shift of atomization and the the growth of you know individual you know, rad, you know radical individuality in the sixties yeah. and what have you. And I think there's also not. I mean, IBM aren't building Port Sunlight, for instance, but there is very much an idea of. Um, the individual worker, but also families. There are all sorts of, you know, not just pool groups, but um, sports teams you can join, things you can collect. They want to, they have various articles in their newsletters about um, it's totally fine for work, uh, married women to come and work for them. This is, you know, something that they are quite clearly there is not a chance <laughs> in the civil service, <laughs> meanwhile. Yeah. This, yeah, this is quite clearly, you know, the kind of ethos they're trying to, they're trying to. And I suspect this is because they can have workers in a certain way. They can probably pay them less. You know, I, there is, I, I don't see any um, uh, good ethics in what they're doing, necessarily. Um, yeah. But it's interesting that kind of persistence of some, I don't know, um, yeah, kind of binding, like, familial corporate mm. kind of structures or, or like a, a kind of innovation in that way at the same time that, you know, those, those, off, those environments seem so redolent of mm. individual kind of competition, atomization and so on. I, don't yeah. know. I, I also I think the, 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 the British environment is an experiment for the American. Mm. I think this is also, I mean, the impact of American culture on Europe is, you know, very well, it's been, or it's been discussed quite a lot, especially in post-war Italy more recently by American scholars, but I think this impact of this, these American corporations changing British society, I think, you know, basically what they're creating is a mini version of the Arasaranen campus architecture of the, of the late 1950s in upstate New York, but in Portsmouth. Mm. Uh, and, and you see that in, in Foster's own office, I think, mm. too, and, and the way Foster sort of tries to... And, embraces sort of a lot of social ethics but in a very sort of corporate 
that kind of way. Gentleman in the in the way nice waistcoat had a question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, both of you. I really enjoyed your uh, talks and uh, learned quite a lot. Um, on the carpet, I, I got really interested in that, and I have just a few queries. So, uh, first of all, um, is there a sense of like kind of um, equalization, if you like, of society through kind of this measure. It's uh, like, you know, when, when with the advent of jeans as trousers, that sense of like kind of differences in class and all sorts of other structures of society appear to be like kind of equalizing a bit. Do you think that had a resonance in, in the development of carpet? I have another question as well. So the second question that I have is, um, um, <coughs> is the advent of uh, wheeled chairs. I didn't see any wheeled chairs in this picture. Presumably they hadn't actually developed by then, but I would be interested to hear more about that as well. Thank you. Yeah, I've got two great questions. I, I, I think certainly the, the um, they, the, the, the modular furniture of the, of the uh, Cosham is definitely using wheeled chairs. I, and I'm not certain whether it's, you know, Helen Miller or someone that they're adopting and the, the kind of action office of, of, of developed in the United States or if these are, you know, lo local UK manufacturers. But I think this is a part of this modularity and, you know, the kind of classic movie scene where someone wheels in from one cubicle into another. I think this is certainly a part of it. Um, and uh, there is a little bit more work for me to do to go to the Foster Foundation and have a look at these chairs. Because this is, a, like you say, this flexibility becomes, you know, the body is able to move differently in the space. Uh, the first question about genes, this is a very interesting. I hadn't <laughs> thought about it like this. I think the uniformity is, is yeah, liberation is, a, is perhaps a part of it. I think, I think it's certainly, it's this, um, it's this, desire for this um, design problem to be addressed. It also, I think, is about providing an element of comfort and almost domesticity. You're within a group, okay, they're not calling them families, but there is one of the IBM acronyms, which is MUM, for these secretarial, secretarial groups, and then it's, they say, no, we can't use MUM as an um, acronym because it's far too kind of maternal. So, I, and I think perhaps the, the carpet is a part of this dom domestic space that's brought slightly into, into the corporate world. But the genes, this is a very interesting, I should go back and look at genes in society. Any, any further on that? Yeah, anything online? Thank you. Um, we actually have, we have a, a comment, um, which is, um, just I think in response to um, your paper, Matthew, it says um, IBM closed their HQ in Edinburgh about 2017. Ironically, it was in five Georgian houses, not together, <laughs> with some facade retention in St Andrew's Square. On the other side of the square, the Scottish Provident, a uh, concrete brutalist but beautiful office building was demolished because it allegedly wasn't adaptable to modern computer use. So... Maybe Elaine, you have. Uh, I was going to say, well. uh, it sounds like a good excuse, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but it, and that all that talk about you could adapt offices because of the ceiling height, because you've got to get your floors in. That seems to have gone. There's no, no reason really for that anymore. But it's still, if you can't convert to residential these days then down it comes and you get these starting to get these battles about embodied energy as a result I, I heard a good story today if I can digress oh well one of my colleagues who joined um, what was the Royal Commission for historical monuments in England in 1985 is retiring he went into the York office and um, set to work with that he was trying to document the chapter house at York 
and their office had a canteen. He went to talk to the, to the photographers. Oh no, you've got to sit with the other investigators. The investigators had carpet in their section. The photographers had lino. And you know that thing, do you remember starting in the civil service in 1980, as I did, if you were grade, clerical grade, no arms on your chairs, executive officers, armrests. So it, it, it resonates with wheels. So, you know, it makes, it makes the idea of total carpet actually quite symbolic of something that is attempting something more democratic, doesn't it? Rosamond West, um, and it's for you, Alistair. Uh, Rosamond says, the press articles on photojournalism of the squats are so interesting. However, is there much visual slash documentary evidence from the squatters themselves? Do we know of any photographs that they took of themselves in their new but temporary homes? That's, that would be fascinating to, if there was. I haven't come across anything like that. I mean, I guess portable cameras weren't that available at this time. But, I mean, one, one interesting thing is that um, although they were very wary of reporters coming in, and you can see that from those um, the mass observers' interaction, um, they, they did do their own recordings. There's an incident where this is talked about in one of the mass observation uh, um, reports that... that um, that some of the squatters are talking about recording themselves. And I, I don't know where those recordings have gone. Um, and there are, some, there are some fascinating oral histories from, from the time, uh, from, from the squats. Um, but yeah, no, not photographs. Much this particular sort of very short. Oh, there you go. Whoa. Okay. okay. Um, very short, but very sort of intense movement that, movement that got so much attention. What impact it had on sort of future um, or sort of small scale or larger scale um, squatting movements? Um, and I think similarly, um, I was really curious because I was looking, while I was looking at your images and, and trying to think of how. Um, Bureau Landschaft has uh, was sort of taken up in um, future use, and also if you're thinking about kind of large scale um, sort of corporate offices now being such a big, big thing, and uh, all these questions around communication, play, like how do you make um, work more fun, and all of these sorts of questions. And I'm I'm curious as to how many, how many things were carried forward, what was left behind, um, yeah. Yeah, it's like continuities and afterlives. Um, yeah, it's 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 really interesting because, in, you know, in a way, what I'm trying to, what I'm interested in is, yeah, resonances across time and, and yeah, precisely those continuities. What happens to something when it ends? Um, it's the you know, it's the kind of mole of history, isn't it? Where does it go? Where do those energies go? Where does that consciousness go? Um, and um, um, I, you know, the, the Volheim quote at the beginning, you, you know, he's, he's talking about this suddenly seeing this new generation of uh, teenagers. And he, in a way, he kind of like declasses them. And um, Tom Crow, in his wonderful mobilization of that passage in his book on the mod and whatnot, similarly, he kind of puts class to one side. But I think class is still there. And really, this is about young a lot of young work, people from working class or lower middle class backgrounds getting jobs with decent pay packages and being able to go out and um, you know saunter around the town and create these new clubs and of course then the other aspect the other kind of key force is commonwealth immigration um, and the creation of that those network of blues clubs and um, uh, North Kensington in particular, but elsewhere, um, famously in Mangrove, which become centres of resistance. Um, so there's a kind of, there's, a, there's a, a different, there's a moment there, a different moment in the kind of late 50s onwards that, that has echoes um, and 
it'd be interesting to see if there are in continuities of individual personnel or of uh, awareness of this earlier moment. I don't, I don't know. And then later, of course, there's lots of squatting in the 60s and 70s that people like Christine Wall have, 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 have written about. And it, it, when you look at the visual culture surrounding it, the documentation, it looks very different. It looks like it has traces of the hippie movement. It looks, it, look, it has a different feel and there's uh, different people involved. And there's less tra you know, sense of the involvement of the Labour Party and Communist Party and of, of a kind of cater of people who had a certain, certain experience. Um, um, so, yeah, there's continuities and, dis and discontinuities but that are still to be investigated, I think. It's almost as if that generation that were young parents in the late 40s, early 50s, get left behind by their kids who sort of come up and, and use up and take away that, that sort of family ethic and re reverse back to associations and camaraderie. No, I was interested wait, with your mention of Unity Theatre, because that is something that continues and is documented, mm -hmm. isn't it? Shall we at, um, attack? Sorry, I'm waiting. It, no, it's no, warm no. in here. <laughs> when your, 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 your side of the office question and how, what we, where the Bureau of Landshaft is today, yeah. really. Yeah, and then actually I might circle back, but the, absolutely, I think this question of afterlife and to some extent obsolescence, technological obsolescence being built that it's into it, so at some point there is an awareness that things will change. And Duffy, Francis Duffy, his consultancy developed around the layers of the building having different life cycles. So furniture and a carpet might last for eight years, the primary structure might last for 80, and it, we can, you know, and, and these things will be changed. Um, I think... Uh, I didn't go on to it, but uh, uh, Willis, Faber, Dumas, I was worried about pushing too much into the 1970s. I thought I might get into trouble. Um, but the, at Willis, Faber, Dumas, um, leisure is a huge part of this building. So the carpet extends up onto the roof, and there is a, a very famous roof terrace and in, you know, these amazing views of Ipswich. And it's, it's you know, the well-being of workers, keeping them in the office is very important. The building, um, the building has a funny relationship with energy. It has its own incredible plant room, which also heats a swimming pool that the workers can use. And there's some very famous, um, Ben, what's his surname? The painter. Anyway, there's a painter who makes some amazing reflective images of this swimming pool. But also the building is built during the first uh, part of, parts of the oil crisis and during the three-day week. So construction can only happen on the, the project during three days of the week. And from, um, and then if I circle back to the class question, I think also maybe we are at this, this is slightly biographical for me, but this moment where um, with, off, you know, the, almost the, the norm, the norm um, for work in this country becomes the service industry. I think this, or it's moving in that direction at least. And uh, I say biographical because it's funny you talk about the civil service, because this is exactly in the, in the, 1970 is when my father is, is one of seven uh, in Birmingham, joins the post office and becomes this, he's the first member of his family with a white collar job. And he's given a bar of soap and a towel and a uh, cloth to dry his hands with and, if, and a pencil. And when each of these things runs out, he has to go back to the office and get a new one of the kind of quartermaster. And he, you know, the, he's exactly this moment, this generational shift where uh, people are no, you know, his family at least, are not working in the kind of manual employment, but are working in offices. And I think this is kind of an interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very much so. The gentleman in the <coughs> middle there had a question. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple of things, very uh, cause and effect. Uh, uh, the, the, the railings in London were all being torn down during the war uh, to, to, to help the war effort. Uh, and they've all been replaced, and you can see their old, their old sockets and where the new ones are all in. Did that possibly have something to do when they put them all back in in reintroducing uh, those restrictions? In, 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 in limiting the amount of squatting. Um, what, like, le yeah, later on? Or, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. I mean, it didn't seem like people had that much trouble getting over the railings. But I do, lo I do love this thing. I think you're so right to look, at, look closely at the railings because there are great photos, like the photo I had at the beginning of 
this woman jumping over, which is yeah, like in, in midair. I think it's one of the best photos. It has a kind of trace, almost like something of um, I don't know, Cartier Bresson, or like it makes me think of like the, but you know, it's not a particularly great photograph, but it has something of like. Because they couldn't take the railings out for the war effort where there was a basement. Because you'd have walked in, in the blackout, nice. you'd, have, you'd have fallen in. So that's why they survive, for his lot to climb over them. That's interesting. <laughs> I think that, are we there? Are we there from the, from the online people? So if I come back here, thank you online people. Thank all the gentlemen at the back. Are you, are you, you're signalling, sir. Does that mean you have a, qu a quick last question? Um, squatting has always been a challenge to bourgeois property values. So could you explain the reason why there's been much more hostility from Labour Party to squatting than from any other party, consistently, in the 40s and in the 60s and in the 70s? It was always Labour politicians who were adamant against squatting. Could you just comment on that? I didn't know that, so I'm not really that well placed to comment, but it's, um, that's interesting to know. I don't know. I mean, does it have something to do with, um, um, well, with this idea of, you know, interrupting the, the, the fair and orderly distribution of housing and, you know, it's messing with um, you know, state-administered housing, isn't it? So if you've got a public you're going to provide housing for people. And people going off and squatting and providing housing for themselves is totally dissonant. Whereas, you know, I mean. And so giving the left the bad name kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and, and so maybe it has something to do with that, but I don't know. I mean, maybe there's other reasons. It's probably one for discussion amongst ourselves. I know we must call this to an end. I'm very grateful to you all for coming. Um, and uh, I think we get, a, do we, we get a refreshment now. So that would be the, play, the place to continue this discussion because we'd welcome your, your thinking on um, the history of, of um, labour politics and individual activism. It's a really good topic. Thank you, everybody online. Thank you, Paul Mellon, for your hosting generosity in perfect perfect IT. But above all, thank you all here and particularly that you join with me in thanking our speakers tonight. Wonderful presentations, very beautifully presented. Thank you both so much. <laughs>